Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is now 3.30 p.m., um, and I think it's time to get started. My name is Kenny Wapelum. I am the manager of special projects here at DPLA. Uh, I just want to take a few moments to give you sort of an introduction to the format of this webinar, as well as introduce our presenter, Mark Breedlove. Um, Mark will be presenting for about 45 minutes, uh, after which we will have um, a brief question and answer period. Um, the way GoToWebinar works is that you will not have access to your microphone, but rather we will accept questions through the, uh, the question bar, the chat bar. So if you have questions, um, please enter them through that method. Uh, I will sort of serve as the moderator and will do my best to um, share those questions with the group and read them aloud and Mark will answer them. If in the event that we can't get through all the questions in the amount of time left over, we will uh, uh, respond to them um, asynchronously and, and, and send them back to you all over email. Um, when this is over, we'll send you a link to the recording as well as to any questions we didn't get to. So that's how it will work. Um, I wanted to now sort of just very briefly introduce Mark. Um, Mark Breedlove is a senior developer at DPLA where he works uh, on design and implementation of DPLA's infrastructure, our ingestion system, our API, of course, and the front-end website. Um, previously, uh, Mark was the technical director at C.me, um, which is a social discovery website for artists and the American Museum of Natural History. Um, so without further ado, uh, Mark, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks very much, Kenny. Um, can you hear me okay? You can, yeah. Okay, excellent. Great. Okay, um, so um, I will get started then. Um, so Kenny discussed who we are. Um, as far as the, the audience, um, uh, the attendees, um, we presume that you are people who have uh, heard about the, a who, sorry, who have heard about APIs and web applications, but don't fully understand what they're all about or who understand uh, generally but want to know what the DPLA's API can do and what role it plays. Uh, so attendees should leave feeling confident in their ability to discuss web API topics and should have a good fundamental understanding of what the DPLA's API provides. If you end up feeling like you need to go back and review what's been covered, please be aware that this presentation is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. If you've registered, uh, you will receive a follow-up email with links to the video, the slideshow, and other res resources. And if you're watching the video or looking at the slideshow, links will be available on, on the uh, whatever page you, you got to it through and uh, on the slideshow itself at the end. Okay. So um, a little overview of what is ahead. Um, I'm going to talk about what what a web application is, very fundamental. Um, I'm going to talk about how web applications share data. That's something I'm going to kind of loop back to um, through the throughout the application. Um, I'm mean, sorry, throughout the presentation. I'm going to talk about what an API is and what a web API is specifically. And then I'm going to go on to talk about the uh, DPLA's API in some detail. And then, as I mentioned uh, near the end, I'm going to give you some further readings that you can uh, follow up on on your own later. Okay. So um, you know that this webinar, uh, this is a webinar about web application programming interfaces, or APIs. And you probably know what's meant by an application, either on the web or on your own computer. But it wouldn't hurt before moving on if I just took a second to make sure that we all really understand what this means. An application in our context is some non-trivial program, usually one that takes uh, different kinds of, of inputs and data sources and works with them to do a variety of related tasks. We don't mean a tiny program that, say, adds a couple of numbers, but you could call a bigger program like a web browser an application. So a web browser manages your input, you know, typing in a URL, for instance, and acquires data from outside sources, you know, websites, uh, coordinates these inputs, and provides you with various kinds of information. It serves some concrete need of yours. It provides you with some information that you ask for. However, your operating system is not an application. We don't use that term for, for, for it. You know, a macro or script or whatever that you use to automatically resize some images in an image editor, for instance, is not considered an application. 
But uh, a web application then is an application um, that runs on a server or your browser and just has, um, you may, may run across the browser and, and the server, and it just draws web applications. It's just a program, sorry, web pages. It's just a program that draws web pages. That's a web application. So um, we know that uh, one of these uh, applications has to get its information from somewhere in order to display it to you. And you may want data that have to be pulled together from many places. Now we know that an application has some kind of uh, data source behind it. How do you keep that, that data source up to date? How do you add new records when they become available or make updates? Say that you need to bring together data from related but distributed sources. You might expect that all of these data, cold as they are from various far-flung sources, would have to be funneled into one centralized database for the application to make use of it. You might assume the application needs everything in one place in order to find it. In one hypothetical example, so someone could download the data from various places and load it into the database, maybe even key it in. Hmm. Well, many organizations have people doing this sort of thing with spreadsheets and other files on a regular basis. But that's really time consuming and difficult to maintain. In the long run, it's an inefficient use of people's time. What if a web application could plug into another database far away and automatically store or display its contents? Let's teach the machines to communicate. Let's have them plug into each other and share their data. That's what APIs are all about. So I'll talk about what an API is. Now the term API, which stands for Application Programming Interface, is used generally to refer to various building blocks for making programs. The term is usually most relevant when it's used to mean a way of manipulating an existing system of some kind with other software, where the controlling software doesn't have to know the details of what's going, in, going on inside the application it's controlling. It's also most relevant when it describes a protocol that allows the controlling software to be written in a different language or use a different kind of platform than the application it's controlling. Lots of applications have APIs. Think of software that you use. You've probably heard of plugins or you know, think of the scripting an office application like a spreadsheet or database. A script, you know, in other words, a program can plug in and manipulate or retrieve data from the application. Most websites are just programs that take information that they own and draw web pages with it. What if we could plug into them and, and get data out? Or in some cases, change their content? Well, we can. That's what web APIs are all about. So let's have a look at one site you may have heard of that relies on a number of APIs to function. And here I will just uh, switch my screen for a second here, uh, switch my tab over here. Presto, here's the DPLA website now. You may not realize it, but the DPLA relies on a couple of APIs. For one thing, if I want to, whenever I do a search, you know, one person asked me a very good question recently. It was like, well, why would I use an API to get this data from the, the you know, if I could just like search for it on the DPLA website. So if I, um, you know, I, I type in hey, a Mark. term, here's a, Mark. yes, excuse me, hello. Hey. Uh, I think we uh, can't see that screen of yours. Right now we just see your desktop. Is there any chance you could... Um... Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Um, so you just see my desktop. Is it, is it blank? Yeah, it's just, it's just the desktop. Um, I don't know if you can... Um, if you have another monitor, if you could flip over to that one or... Um... Yeah, sure. Um, so, so let's see. In that case... Um, um, let me just, um, let me try something here. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Oh, there we go. Now I can see it. There, oh, so that, that's funny. It's, it was confused because uh, it, I had this in the same tab as the, okay. uh, whatever. Um, anyhow, Sorry to interrupt you. Go so, ahead. Yeah, no, th thanks, for, yeah, that, th thanks for that. That's good. So what all I did is I, I, I typed in a search term. Here's a DPLA website that you're probably familiar with. You do this. You get your search results here. This, the, the front end of the website that you're working with is actually using an API. 
it's actually going to a different server than the um, this this website, and it's pulling all of these results. Like there are these boxes on the left that show you these counts. You know, it's obviously got the um, the results in the in the middle here, and uh, that is actually using the, the DPLA API. And here's another thing I wanted to show you: this this little box in the lower right, DPLA on Twitter. Um, no one on our staff that I'm aware of is is you know typing those those Twitter updates into the into the web page. You know, uh, these we're basically plugged into Twitter via Twitter's API, and we're just pulling that that data from from Twitter. So there, here's a here's a uh, you know post about Nelson Mandela. If I click through to this, if I, I can actually look at it on Twitter. And it's just taking the same data that came out of that's on Twitter here, and it is just kind of piping it into our, our web page, so so to speak. So um, another another example I wanted to show you um, was I don't know if you can see this, Kenny. Uh, this this dogs page here. Yep, we can see it. Okay. So this is simply a, a little page that's on my computer here, uh, but. The point is, it's getting all these dogs pictures from from the DPLA's database, right? Um, I didn't have to download these these dog pictures onto my computer in order to, to see them. There's some there's some code that runs inside of this this uh, this web page where um, don't you don't have to memorize this. There won't be a test on this, but if you can see that stuff that I'm highlighting there, there's some code that is basically um, telling the telling my browser to go out and just fetch this from the DPLA's API. So um, there are um, there are some more examples that I'm going to I'm going to to show you later. Um, this um, this page that I'm showing right now, if you can see it, is our app library page where there are a lot of goodies here uh, with more examples that we can uh, we, we can we can look at. So um, uh, I'll go back to the presentation. Um, I'm going to try to maximize this again. And uh, Kenny, can you confirm that this is is showing up? Yep, you're all good. Okay, cool. Um, thanks a lot. All right, so um, I'll talk about how web applications do this plugging in and sharing. Um, so uh, we looked at some web pages. Web pages go over HTTP. You've probably heard that acronym. Um, they communicate. Web applications also uh, communicate over HTTP, that, which is the network protocol of the web. So we have web pages for people, and you're familiar with these. But there are documents for machines too. It's sort of like web pages for machines that only have the data, that don't have any of that presentational stuff. They don't have the, the graphics and the whatever, the boxes and stuff. It's just, just the data part of the web page. These documents carry, um, these, these work over the same protocol as, as web pages, these, these API, the API stuff that I'm going to start talking about. Um, so this allows us to economize a great deal on technological resources, you know, using the same programming experience that we already have for, for doing you know, websites, we can do the, the data, the pure data part of it as well, the API part. So this same HTTP, this protocol, is, is flexible. It serves many purposes. It specifies the same sort of question and response mechanism that your browser uses to talk to web servers. It's relatively robust and tolerant of failure, and it lets um, the client software deal with with you know glitches and failures pretty pretty well compared to other protocols. So um, here's an example just for your amusement. Don't be scared off by it because <laughs> you won't be tested on it. I just want to show you uh, this because the uh, the program uh, makes its request in this specially formatted text, and the server responds in this kind of specially formatted text as well. And although it's encoded with various technical terms, it is just text, and a developer who needs to troubleshoot it can read it more easily than some other kinds of electronic communications. So um, 
developers like this this kind of thing, engineers, developers like this kind of thing. So we're getting close to the good parts, but to give you some background, I'll show you one thing that goes on behind the scenes that may help you appreciate how the API data are going to be formatted when you start seeing the results I'm going to show you. You'll uh, occasionally hear the term serialization when talking with developers who work on APIs. So say you have a spreadsheet with a bunch of cells, like you see, uh, well, that actually, or a database, like you see here on this page, it's got a bunch of rows and columns. Uh, how do you send that data to another system in another organization so that it's useful to some program that you did not write? We need to take all those cells and string them together, make them serial, so to speak. We need to get them into a text document that's convenient to transmit over HTTP. And that's what's happening, on, uh, happening in this slide where you see the data and all of those cells being communicated in that text with the curly braces. A lot of computer programs know how to read that text in the curly braces, which brings us to JSON. In the world of web applications, the most popular format for serializing information in a database or data store is JSON, JavaScript object notation. Our web applications, like the DPLA and its API, transmit and receive information in JSON which is just text with special features that make it easy for machines to make sense of and easier for humans to read than a bunch of binary data or even other text formats. So um, the librarians in the audience probably recognize that bit of text on the left. That's a mark, that's part of a mark record. Uh, and this used to be pretty, pretty cutting edge for, for library data at one time. You notice it's very compact. It saves memory, it saves storage bytes and everything, but it's not the easiest thing to read. And the part on the right is JSON. So it's much easier, for example, to pick out that the language of that document is English, that the display date, or I'm sorry, that the, the, the date range is from 1978 to the present and so forth. Well, JSON is a very compact way of delimiting and encapsulating the serialized data, relatively compact, not as compact as MARC, but better than XML. And it's become the most popular format for web API data. If you're already familiar with XML, it performs some of the same jobs as XML, but with many fewer extra characters in addition to the data that you want to communicate. JSON is usually easier for web programmers to work with than XML. XML has some strengths for certain things, but the speed and lightweight of JSON make it the preferred choice for most web applications. All modern programming languages that you or the developers in your organization are likely to, to use have convenient interfaces for working with JSON. Some of them, like JavaScript, obviously, supporting it out of the box without one having to include any extra code libraries. It lets us communicate different types of data, like numbers, characters, and true-false values, in addition to lists of things. The DPLA API uses an extension of JSON that's very important to metadata librarians and people who are on the cutting edge of library technology called JSON-LD. And so to stay on track with this presentation, I'm not going to get very far into this, so don't be concerned if this doesn't sink in. But JSON-LD is JSON for linked data. It's for expressing RDF data in JSON and maps, to, and maps the various properties in an API result to ontology concepts. If you, haven't, if you haven't heard of RDF, it stands for Resource Description Framework, and it's a language or specification for representing distributed data, like the data you find all over the web, where anyone can say anything about any topic. It's a way of linking different fields together and accounting for multiple authorities with their own definitions of things. Metadata librarians in your organization will be happy that the DPLA's API is expressed in RDF and JSON-LD. So now, finally, with all of that background, we're ready to have a look at the DPLA's API. So I want to query the DPLA's API. Where does this DPLA API exist? How do I ask it a question? Well, it has a URL, just like any other resource on the web, like a website. Here's how you would form a simple query for kittens. You can do this in the address bar of your browser if you have an API key, which I'll talk about soon. If you do that, you'll get a bunch of JSON data back in the browser window. 
URLs in general probably look pretty familiar to you, but let me just point out that there's uh, a scheme, which some people call the protocol, that, that part in red right there, a domain, which is the, the brownish part, a path, which is the blue and green part, and a query string, which is the purple part. The query string is the good part. That's what you change in order to ask our API your questions. This is just an introduction. We'll iterate over this in the next few minutes, so I'll, uh, it will have a chance to sink in. I need to cover another preliminary uh, before that, which is that API key parameter that you see in the example in the purple query string right there. So um, the API key parameter is necessary for all requests uh, to the DPLA API. It's used, we use it for just for aggregate statistics, in other words, counting total requests and users, but we don't use it to store any personally identifiable information or track people in particular. The only other purpose of the API key is to assist, to assist us in troubleshooting in case there's some kind of problem with user searches. Unfortunately, that just really doesn't happen very often, but you know, we have it if we, if we need it. So, uh, if we have time at the end of this presentation and you want to see, I can demonstrate part of the sign-up process for getting an API key. But for the sake of staying on topic with some high, with some key high-level concepts, um, I'm going to simply refer you to the URL on the screen for uh, detailed instructions. And you'll see this again in the further readings part at the end of the presentation. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, uh, let's look at some concrete examples of querying our API. Say I want to find all of the DPLA items that have to do with ducks. Well, here's an example of how you would ask a question of our API. The, yeah, it, uh, it's, yeah, so the part after the question mark there, you know, it sort of like indicates uh, that you're asking a question, of course. Uh, the query string that I spoke of earlier uh, is the part that you fill in to describe what you want to find. The easiest way to search for anything in any field of our records is to use this Q parameter that you see on the screen, where Q just stands for query. And here I'm specifying that my query term, my query is the term ducks. Uh, and this is an abridged example, but here you can see that some records were returned that match my term in their subject field, where it says name ducks down there. And uh, here are some examples where you can combine uh, you can combine different uh, different terms. You can say ducks and geese, and you'll get everything that that has you know those two things it, those two terms in the same record. And you can say ducks or, in which case it means what you intuitively know that to mean: ducks or geese, either or. And we have what are called wild cards with this this asterisk character here. So. If I put Q equals M-I-G-R-A-T star, then I'll get um, items with, with uh, words beginning uh, in those, in those, with those letters. Uh, furthermore, you can pick out specific fields that you want to search, like look for the where the title is duck, and you can uh, search for date ranges for items in our collection that um, you know, have date data. And um, another nice feature is the ability to find things that pertain to a particular place. So in this example, um, source resource dot spatial equals Oregon. So um, uh, that means like items that uh, someone uh, keyed in saying that it has something to do with, with Oregon, not necessarily that the item itself is located there. So um, you can, uh, if you don't want to see all of that, um, all of that JSON that, that I showed you, you only want certain fields, then you can pick which fields you want in this in this fashion, and you can um, you can even specify multiple fields in this way. And we have some sort functionality, and we have a pretty cool feature, which is to show items that are uh, relevant to a certain vicinity around a certain, a certain point. So you can say, you know, find me all items that, that uh, said they have to do with like the Boston, the region around Boston, by using the sorts of, of um, parameters that you see at the bottom of that, of that slide there. 
And um, I'm going to actually give you a little a little demo of, of some of this in just a second. So again, don't worry if this isn't sinking in. I'll demo some of this quickly for you. But um, sometimes you know you get a lot of results back, and you only want to see a few at a time. And we have some pagination parameters that let you say, for instance, just show me you know uh, two results on a page, and and show me the the tenth page of that or something. Um, so that's what these these parameters are all about. Okay, and um, one very interesting thing uh, is facets, and facets um, are what give you those those lists of things like in the uh, in the, the 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 navigation bar on the DPLA site where it shows you you know the top publishers or the top providers or the top you know types of content for that particular particular thing. So um, I'm going to risk, uh, again, going um, back to my browser view here. And um, Kenny, uh, let me know if, um, does this window show up, Kenny, that I have a, a, a window here on my yep. screen that yep, has? It does. Okay, cool. Excellent. Great. So remember that, that demo that I, that I showed you that had the picture, it had like a bunch of, of dogs on it? Well, this is... This is a cool tool called Postman that I'll uh, give you a link to at the end of the presentation. But it's basically a Chrome browser plugin that lets you do this stuff really easily. You can see up here it's got this, this address like the one that I, that I showed you, right? Uh, but it just kind of breaks it down for you here in these fields and lets you play around rather easily with, without any typing, without much typing at all. So here's that query. This is equivalent. This is practically the same query that, that was that drew those dogs on the page. And I can issue the request and down here um, you can see uh, the you can see what the what the re results look like. In this case um, here in the uh, remember I was talking about I was talking about the fields, how it, how you can tell it which, which fields to return. Here I said return ID object that happens to be the thumbnail you know, is shown at, which happens to be like a link to, to the uh, to the resource on the provider page, and the source resource, which is like a lot of the, the data about the, the the image itself, and you get these 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 um, these fields down down below here, uh, and I can I can show you um, like the basic uh, that basic ducks query that I that I showed you is is right here, you know, and you get a ton of you ton, a ton of data back, and you're like, oh, that's that's really too much data. All I want to see is like the ID and subject. So you can just do fields ID um, source resource subject. Oops, like this. You know, and here you see that um, I'm only getting back the um, like the subject and the and the ID here. So this is a pretty cool tool. It lets you um, experiment with. So you can go back to the slides uh, that I that I showed you with all these examples. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to show you is um, is the um, if you can see, can you uh, can you see this yep. this DPLA website? Okay, cool. So remember that that duck search. So this um, this business here with contributing institution. That's facets. All that is is facets and image, text, moving image. So this, uh, if you can see this this um, presentation slide now. Oops, sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, go back to my facets there. Um, that's the kind of data that draws that kind of a result. So now you can imagine what if you were creating your own web application. You can imagine you might want to have a list of like top contributing institutions from DPLA or top types of images or something like that, right? You can use the facets for it. And there are um, actually some cool, um, um, there are some very cool apps that have been, been created with our API using facets. And um, you can see me searching for ducks in this app called DPLA Visualizations. And here we have a nice bar chart showing us in the DPLA collection for ducks, you know when, uh, it's what the most popular date ranges were for items having to do with ducks. 
And this is just facet data that's been taken and presented in a very nice way. Hey, Mark. So the, um, yes, sorry. Uh, that one is another window, unfortunately, so we can't quite see uh -huh. the... Um, uh, there. Yeah, okay. Do you want to open um, it up in that window you have right there? The Yeah, let me, let me see. Um, that's... Um, yeah, I'll just um, I'll just uh, do some do some quick like um, let's see copy and paste or something. Um, let me see. Uh, I'll just go. I'm, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to our uh, app uh, app library. I think. Uh, sorry. Um, excuse me. Apps. Assuming you can see my browser. Yeah, we can see it now. Here. Yeah. So. Um, Let's see, I think it's on the next page here. Um, Deploy visualizations. Um, well, I don't want to take too too much. I should, if I'm, I want to stay, I'm flow, partner flow. Um, Is that it right there, the visual search prototypes that you're talking about? Oh, uh, um, yeah, I actually think. Uh, well, this is another one that's that's pretty cool. It's all the, all the same, it uses, um, it uses some. Um, uh, it uses our API in a very creative way. So if you can see that, you see this. The, these these are facets data mm -hmm. right, right over here, and this bar chart is done with with facets. So um, that's basically all I wanted to point out with with those. Um, I will get back to our our program here. Um, so can you? Does that look? Uh, can you see that the the slide now? Yep, we can see your slides. Okay, cool. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is if you know the ID of a particular item that, that you want, uh, you can refer to it explicitly like, like this um, with the, the full ID and the URL there. Okay, so um, so you've kind of seen a lot of this, this, this JSON uh, in the results there without me explaining it it fully. So, um, you know, now that you've seen, you can the, the, see the ways in which you can ask different kinds of questions and control the information that's returned. I'll just go back and describe in a little more detail the parts of those JSON responses that you've been looking at. So, with every response, you have some information about how many items matched your query versus how many are shown in the current response. And remember those pagination parameters that I that I showed you. Uh, sometimes they're just too many to show on one page. Uh, the docs property, uh, which is always a list of, of things right here, uh, you see that in the box in the, uh, on, the, on the left there, that docs property is your list of items. And uh, if you specified facets, which we were just talking about, there, there will be a facets property like that. Okay, on the following slides, uh, I'll zoom in on some more parts of our uh, API response. Uh, some of the fields in the examples that, that, that follow are concerned with the DPLA's digital representation of the data, our own identifier, for instance, when it was ingested, from who it came, and all that. Um, uh, but, you know, before, and, and we've also got some fields that show pretty much the original data before we mapped it to our fields. Um, but the fields that actually describe the thing that was digitized, for example, a book on a shelf, or a film strip are called the source resource fields and are probably what you are after. So here's a slide showing those digital representation fields that I was talking about, right? It's pretty, it's not um, super easy to make, to make sense of. It's basically a lot of internal data um, the, the, uh, about our own internal data. And so this original record, again, is kind of you know, the, the way the providing institute to, institution chose to, chose to label its fields, you know, and what they actually sent us. But now here's this source resource, and that's what you're, what most users of our API are after. That's where, um, where we've kind of mapped things to make it consistent. So from one provider, we have all these providers, we have so many, like hundreds of providers in our, in our system, uh, you know, for, but they all, they, if, you, if you see spatial, source resource spatial, you know that that is, that's the same kind of data as another, as the spatial part from another 
provider. And this is again is like describing a uh, some lithographs. You know, it's describing the actual thing at the end of the line that you're after. Okay. Um, now all of these fields, including the count, limit, and docs properties, are relayed from our Elasticsearch search index through our API to you without any substantial transformation. Our API is a very thin layer between you and our Elasticsearch servers. Now Elasticsearch is a search engine that organizations like the DPLA can run to provide really powerful custom searches for the, of their content. It gives us those nice facets that we saw earlier. That is really just an Elasticsearch feature, just like brought sort of straight to you through, you know, without any, you know, um, uh, manipulation. So um, if you've heard of Solar, Elasticsearch is related to Solar and that it uses the same code library called Lucene uh, for core, its core search technology. So we're getting, we're nearing the end, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I'm going to review some of the things that I went over. Um, I talked about how APIs are, are everywhere. You know, a web API is just kind of another, uh, another take on something that you've actually seen before, rather, uh, whether you realize it or not, you know, something that's a, that's a way of manipulating, uh, you know, programs and, and, you know, examples exist everywhere. Uh, we've talked about how, um, APIs work over really flexible and well-established existing protocols. Very, very important, very important for your developers and just for the sort of progress of technology. You know, we're not like re reinventing the wheel because uh, it just uses HTTP, uses the same, you know, mechanisms as the web. Uh, and uh, the web API data are usually in, in JSON, which is very easy to work with, light, lightweight, flexible. Um, it, you can do um, customized, very customized searches, with very customized results, and I hope this slideshow maybe could act as a, like a little bit of a jumping off point for you, um, but I'll show you some documentation later that gives you the full lowdown on all of the options available. Um, our API observes standards that will make your developers and your metadata librarians happy. Uh, we use Elasticsearch, which is a very powerful search engine, uh, and um, we, I showed you some examples from the, uh, like the app library. If you check out dp.la slash apps, you'll have tons of very fun and very interesting um, apps to, to play with that might um, kind of whet your appetite and stimulate um, some new ideas there. Okay, so um, uh, from here on out, uh, I'll provide you with some links to that documentation and further reading. Please note that uh, this presentation is available online and you'll be emailed a link to it if you've registered for the webinar. So don't worry if you can't jot all of this down. But first, here are some links to our own DPLA API documentation and instructions on getting an API key. And here are some more links to the DPLA's sample code developer code libraries and app showcase where you can look at what other people have done with our API. And here's a link at the bottom to Postman, that Chrome extension that I was, um, that I was showing you that lets you experiment with API requests without having to do any programming. It saves you a lot of typing. Uh, it lets you save your searches. And uh, there's, um, I can provide you with a bundle of, of examples too, which hopefully, I'm hoping that that, that link there works for that. Um, and so here are some more code samples. Uh, the first one, simple JavaScript apps, is uh, those are quite simple and a good starting point if you don't want to install any programming languages. All you need for that is a web browser and a text editor. Um, another example down, down there, demo of search, of like drop down search suggestions using our API. And here are some links if you are more of a metadata person or you're sort of interested in some more advanced topics. So um, that is, this Wikipedia article is a pretty good, kind of as plain English as, as you can make it, kind of explanation of JSON-LD. Um, and then we've got our metadata application profile here. And what this is is 
it's a very detailed explanation of what all those fields mean, like all that stuff under source resource, like what exactly does spatial mean and what exactly does temporal or, you know, like all that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so there you go. Let's see. Um, that pretty much, that's pretty much it. That's what I have for you. And, and I, um, I believe it's now, uh, we've got some time for questions and answers. Um, Kenny, um, Sure. Are there any, uh, any of those? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was great. Um, so if folks have questions, feel free to type them in um, into the, uh, the question or chat pane, um, and uh, I will do the best to uh, share them with the group and read them aloud so that Mark can answer them. And if, you know, if we have a bunch and we don't get to them all, we can certainly follow up with email. But if you do have questions now, we've got about 20 minutes or so, so feel free to type those in. All right, they're coming in now. Um, just give me a moment. Let me uh, get these set up here. Um, we have a question here. Is it? I'm just going to share this over the question thing so that so that people can read it as well. Um, the question is: Is it possible to access anything from the provider's original record through the DPLA API? That's a good question. It, it is. It's in that original record field, but um, it's not exactly the uh, you know string of characters that they they sent us. It's uh, it's been turned into to JSON basically. So for some of our providers, they they gave us um, XML, for instance, and we're showing you a JSON representation of the data. So it's not li literally what they sent sent us, but it's it's pretty close for, at least if you want to sort of diagnose, like, I don't know where some field is coming from or, or whatever. Um, I'll note that in our new, uh, ver in the next version of our API, it's going to be different, and you really are going to have a link to really the original document that they sent us. So if they gave us XML, you're really going to be able to to follow a link through to that, um, but it's just not the case yet. It's part of our new ingestion system, and uh, if you want more information on our new ingestion system, I can um, we can like pass uh, messages somehow, and I can kind of forward you to that information. Thanks, Mark. Okay, got another got another question here. Um, how does the DPLA API compare to other APIs in terms of allowing users a variety of options for searches and so forth? In other words, should we expect most APIs to resemble what the DPLA has done? Um, probably, probably not. I wouldn't. Um, for example, like the the use of uh, the the facets feature. Um, and uh, I mean the the DPLA's API serves this particular. Uh, this particular purpose of representing, um, you know, digital archives and digital library information. So if you had an API for like an electronics company or something like that, or maybe like a natural history museum, right? Uh, well, you, you you know, facets and that kind of thing would would be useful, but I wouldn't. I would I would say that that you could you should expect to be able to talk you know JSON you should be able to expect to work with you know to be have to use like an API the way we do this API business is very common I mean sorry API API key excuse me this API key sort of thing is very common and most importantly the way your developers your, your developers shouldn't have to write any special code to like to parse it or anything, like if they know how to use the DPLA's API, they're probably, it's probably very quick for them to figure out the nuances of, of any other one. We do use a lot of like standards in the form of the query and response, if that, if that helps. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question here. Um, is it easy to embed a query into my web page using my institution's styling? 
Yes, using your institution's styling. So um, you know that, um, uh, like that 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 dogs example, right? Um, that was uh, I don't know if I have it. Uh, let's see. Uh, that that was like a very uh, bare bones kind of kind of HTML. Um, the it, it's really independent of of the style. The whole the whole thing is the uh, the you, you know it's, it's it would be the responsibility of your developers to write certain HTML tags. Like they could, they'd get back this this JSON right, and then they would just take it and for every item in the JSON they'd pick out like the subject and then they'd put it inside of a div or inside of a paragraph tag or something like that. And it's totally up to them how they want to put that into a paragraph tag or something. And it's totally up to them what kind of style sheet they want to use for it. So a absolutely, the whole one point I should have made earlier was that, you know, this separates the uh, the presentation from, from the content, right? The, the content being, you know, that data about ducks, you know, the subject where, you know, it's a, it's a lithograph from Japan or something, right? Um, it doesn't say anything about what you're going to do with it, really. Um, I hope that that uh, how you're going to present it. You know, what color you're going to make it, what kind of div it's going to go in. Does that does that help? I hope that that helps. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so we're getting quite a few questions at this point. Um, let me see if I can get another one in here. Um, uh, are there limits placed on results from the API, less such as you know the number of records returned or the frequency of searches per hour, that sort of thing? Good question. Um, the only limit is that the maximum number of items per result is is 500, and then you just have to ask for another page. Okay, so um, that's actually quite a quite a lot. That's quite a huge response. But like you know, if you if, the, if say there are 10,000 records that match your search, you just need to use those pagination parameters that I, that I showed you and just do page two, page three. We do not have any uh, uh, like uh, quota limits. Okay, so uh, we're not currently um, like throttling you by the number of uh, requests per minute or anything like that. Um, this has generally been no problem. Uh, we've we've been we've gone on years now without that that being an issue. So uh, part of the reason we have the API key is just in case someone did something. It's basically like as a developer, please use you know common sense and uh, you know uh, don't open up like a million. <laughs> don't be a botnet or whatever. You know, don't 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 open up a million connections from all over the globe at the same second. Uh, but um, other than that, no, um, it's just kind of like common sense and we'll check out your API key and just ask you if there's, if everything's okay with your code, why, you know, why are you hitting us with 100 requests a second, basically. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Um, I kind of have two similar questions here. One is, um, you mentioned the new API. Um, when will this be available? And I think relatedly, um, are you considering expanding the DPI API to allow for participating institutions to update or even post their metadata via API? So um, when do you think the new API will come out and um, are there plans um, for participating institutions update or even post their metadata via the API? Yeah, the, the new API is um, sometime this year. <laughs> um, uh, sometime, I, I can't say exactly by myself. Um, I'd have to discuss that with some other people. Um, as far as, but 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 not like you know, I don't think it's going to be like uh, like next year or something like that. Um, the um, uh, as far as uh, providers posting stuff, no, uh, it's it's really a, a QA thing. Uh, so um, uh, part of the value proposition of the DPLA uh, is that that we have metadata people on staff who inspect what's what's coming to us and uh, we uh, we go out and 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 pull it and make sure it all you know it's all ship shape and everything before we actually put it in our search index um, 
uh, when, peop when when someone has when, when a provider after a provider's kind of gone through this QA stage, it, it happens pretty quickly. It's not like we inspect every record after that. We just kind of put it on automatic, but we still pull it and we have to make sure it kind of validates and everything. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Okay, um, got another question here. What's the coolest thing you've seen someone do with the DPLA API, and what would you like to see done with it? So, what what has been done so far that that you really have liked, and maybe you know what maybe hasn't been done, but you are kind of curious to see created or built out? Yeah. So, one of the cool, some of the coolest things. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen here. Is this search the DPLA by color? Is yeah, this thing I can see it. Yep. Okay, cool. So check this out. Um, so that's cool. Um, uh, that's an, this is an interesting thing. Uh, someone actually sh showed this off like at the last DPLA Fest. Um, there's purple. Um, you can do you know, like any kind of like basic color. Um, um, I don't think chartreuse worked last time I, I checked, but, but like um, let's do uh, well. Just look, let's not do something boring. But let's do um, um, you know. Um, well, I don't know. I'm gonna do something boring. <laughs> Red, you know. Oh, so that's interesting. You know, th basically, this person. Uh, this is not happening on on the fly. The the person who wrote this kind of kind of analyzed a lot of, of data. But the way he did it was he analyzed a lot of data locally and then kind of stored stored the data, but but he grabbed all of the, the image data by hitting our API for it. Um, you know, um, that color browse thing. And where, where would I like the API to go? Before we uh, come out with this new version I was talking about, we do have some, some improvements that I'd like to see that we're talking about uh, doing actually way before that, like in the next, the first quarter or second quarter of 2016, that will make it possible for people to write mobile apps against our API. So there are actually some things that we need to do to make that uh, kind of more sort of standards compliant, the way you would do it with a with a particularly like with a mobile app. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing mobile apps, actual actual mobile apps come, come along. You can certainly write a browser app that works well in a like on a mobile device, though. So um, I don't know. It's kind of a pet thing of mine. Maybe um, to see more more languages, more programming languages supported or something in our software development kits, whatever. Cool. Thanks, Mark. And I should say that you know we we do have a library as Mark was. Uh, displaying earlier. We have uh, dp.la slash apps is a really nice showcase of some cool things people have done. And if you um, happen to develop and you build things, please send it our way. We are always happy to add new things that app library. So if you happen to take a look at the API and build something cool you want to share with everyone, shoot us an email and we'll, we'll put it up on our website. Um, okay, I've got another question. We actually have two questions about um, JSON LD um, and we asked Someone asked, do you know of any people using your JSON-LD metadata? The answer is, is not yet. Um, the thing about JSON-LD is it's a strategic thing that's going to come to fruition a little bit down the line. But um, again, and with this, this new version of the API that I'm, that I'm talking about, um, the um, the stuff's really going to be like followable by a machine client a bit better. Um, so in our current JSON LD, there are uh, there are some um, I guess like some identifiers that that can't you can't really do anything with as far as I understand. Again, now my I'm I'm not um, I'm not like a I'm not a um, a, a linked data. Uh, Specialist, you know, this is actually not my my biggest strength, so I don't want to say anything that's that's not correct. But but it's it's more of like, look, let's let's get something that's standards compliant, that's that's like that's, that's that allows us to be to do things in a standards compliant way that that, that JSON LD people are going to be happy with when we finally you know add some more features. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Um, question here about DPLA's GitHub. Are there any DPLA web app projects in GitHub that are in need of additional contributors? 
Are there any mailing lists where groups communicate what they are working on? That's interesting. So um, if you go to our app library, there are some apps that have not been, uh, I'm sorry, apps. Uh, if you go to our, our, our developers site, so um, can, you, can you see, see this, this window still? I'm going to go to yeah, uh, info developers, right? So if you go here and you go um, sample code and libraries, here are some, some of these have not been updated in a while. So we could use contributors to 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 maybe um, keep them keep them up to date. Like maybe they're um, they're not updated for um, the the latest version of whatever programming language. Um, the other thing is we're gonna um, we're going to do some work at the DPLA to actually work work on on these or to um, maybe work on our own uh, libraries soon that we can that we can sort of like, um, I was going to say vouch for, that we can, we can kind of like have under our, in our repos and, and sort of have under our, our control to, um, to be able to, to manage updates and, and stuff like that. So contact us. I would say go to, um, on our site, go to, go to contact here. If you're interested in, in helping fill this out, um, you can go to, like either API or technical help and get in touch with us. Mailing lists, um, we do, Kenny, we have um, a list on, I don't think so. We, we could, that's a good idea. We might, um, it might be interesting to set something like that up. But, yeah, um, we had, I we, don't know in, in the past we sort of had, um, you know, DPLA was a result of a sort of a two and a half year, two year planning process and there were some work streams and there was a technical advisory committee. And as you can see, as Mark's showing, there still is um, a mailing list. It hasn't been very active, but, you know, if there's if people are interested in sort of setting up a discussion thread in some way, um, we could, you know, we could consider repurposing that and make it more of like instead of tech advisory, maybe like tech discussion, something along those lines. Yeah. That could be interesting. Okay. Um, I got one other question here. Um, let me just quickly get to it. Have any university libraries integrated DPLA results into their library search results, um, such as Bento Box or otherwise? Oh, good question. I know someone on staff would probably have a good answer for that. Um, I just can't think of a good a good example of that particular thing at the moment. I'm I'm sorry. Um, what we can do, because um, we're going to send a follow up email for everyone who's registered, is we can note that question and. Um, just respond to it in the in the follow-up email. Would that be okay, Kenny? I can sure. That yeah, that, that's we can certainly do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that actually does it for the questions. Um, unless we probably have time for one more. Um, if uh, someone has one on their mind, they want to get it in now. Otherwise, um, maybe we can uh, consider ending a couple of minutes early. Um, but yeah, Mark, we can certainly include that question in our response. Um, we can. Great staff to see if people have good examples. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, I don't believe a question. We do have a suggestion. I think there's a typo um, on the map page, but that's something that we can handle. Um, but I think that that will probably do it. Um, if you guys have any other follow-up questions, um, we will, uh, you know, have a bunch of resources in that follow-up email as well as maybe contact, so you can do it there. But, Mark, thank you very, very much for, uh, for this presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Kenny is the, the presentation master of all this uh, presentation <laughs> technology, which is not always too uh, obvious to me. So thanks very much, Kenny. Of course. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said, we will follow up in the next day or two with a archived version of this re um, uh, broadcast, as well as um, some resources that Mark mentioned at the end of his uh, presentation and um, uh, in response to that question that we weren't really able to get to. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, um, and uh, yeah, be in touch.